days before the Holy Week and the Holy Resurrection Feast. So this gospel was uniquely chosen by the church to set the stage. It's setting a stage for an upcoming spiritual training. It's the, word, the word spiritual training is a little bit better instead of just a fasting period. So they're setting the stage for the upcoming spiritual training and it's described as a spiritual voyage and the church calls it a spiritual journey. Similar to any kind of journey, there's preparation. Hence, there's a preparation week. And the direction that you decide to take in the spiritual journey depends on two points. Where you stand and where your goal destination is. Spiritually, where you stand is who you are, and it requires self-reflection, the stark truth, no disguises, no cover-ups, who you are, no hidden agendas, you and the person that you see in the mirror. Before you set and determining your goal and your goal destination, make sure that your goal destination is worthwhile, because you are only as good as your goal is. You're only as good as your goal is. For example, if I want to climb a mountain, and I climb any mountain, I only have an honor from that mountain. But if I climb Mount Everest, I have the honor and the merit of climbing the highest mountain in the world. Set your goal so that your honor is equal to that in your goal. As a Christian, heaven is not so much the goal as God is our goal. Of course, wherever God is, there is heaven. Because it's not heaven that makes God, it's God that makes the heaven. So wherever he goes, it is heaven. God is my goal. And like today's Pauline epistle says, we want to be partakers of his divine, of his divinity. Partakers of his divinity. So God is our goal. God is our goal not then, but God is our goal from now until then. I want to develop a deeper relationship with my Lord. I want to have a more fulfilling and intimate friendship with Him. I want to grow in knowledge with Him. So now that we agree that God is our goal, is He your only goal? We all are coming here today knowing that God is our goal. This is common knowledge. But is He your only goal? You, you think twice about that. Wait, I, have my, I have other goals in mind. I have other intentions. I have other things that I want to do. Stand, stand. Is God your only goal? Is God your only goal? God. Is God your only goal? So, in the journey so far, we have two points. I don't want to prolong this too much. Two points. Who you are, and who your goal destination is. St. John Cassian adds a third point that some people miss, and he calls it purity of heart. And he sets it right before God is our goal. And he explains, St. John Cassian says, the first thing is to have a goal, that it may become a mark for the mind. Unless one keeps this before himself, he will not arrive at his ultimate goal, that is God and the love of God. Yes, our end goal of life is indeed the dwelling in the love of God in his kingdom. But there is an immediate goal which is as critically important. Be mindful, my brethren, we also have an immediate goal which no one can achieve, by which no one can achieve the ultimate goal, and that is purity of heart. And he says, an example is the farmer. The farmer sets his hope on a great, bountiful harvest. And he has an immediate goal by which he cannot reach the ultimate goal. And that is to keep his fields free from thorns, from weeds, and from rodents. On the same note, Habib Gerbis, Deacon Habib Gerbis, he is a... Uh, beautiful, wonderful, spiritual, revolutionary man that lived a little over 100 years ago in the turn of the 20th century. 
He's a full deacon. He gave a very simple <coughs> sermon, but it was very profound in its meaning, and he was talking to people. And he says, I'm saying meaning, he says, if an honored guest of high reputation comes to visit you in your home or in your room, would you not prepare your home first by ridding it of all its dirt, all its filth and bad odors, and then you bring out the finest china and the best tablecloth? If this home is your soul, if this home represents you, and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords decides to visit you, will you not first cleanse yourself from profanity, rid yourself from the foul odors of sin, and cut off all attachments from wretched lusts? Blessed are you if you purify your heart for the dwelling of the Lord. So purity of heart is our immediate goal by which we can reach being partakers with the divinity of Christ, that is, being in the love of Christ. So, purity, holiness, because without it, we are unable to approach the holy. Only the holy and the pure are going to approach the holy of holies. And it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And this is our day-to-day -day goal, purity of heart. Now, I don't still understand how I can get there. This is where today's gospel comes in. There are three messages in today's gospel. The first one are the tools that are missing that connects you from where you stand, where your goal is, and your day-to-day -day goal, which is purity of heart. How do I get to this purity of heart day by day? It's by the three tools that were mentioned today. It is the proper use, use of those tools, and something that maybe we won't touch on is a journey requires a surrendering of your life. So the first are the three tools that today's gospel mentioned. It's obvious there are three tools that the, today's gospel who caught them. The three tools are giving alms, prayer, and fasting. The church first, and, and our Lord Jesus Christ stresses that these tools are mandatory. They are necessary. They're not optional. Because he says, when you give alms, he didn't say, if you give, when you pray, do this. It's not, if you pray, when you fast, there is no question, there's no option about it. These three tools are necessary to reach and to function successfully in your journey and to reach your goal. So these are fundamental. They're necessary for success. So you can have purity of heart. These three go together. The church fathers say that prayer has two wings. Without it, it won't reach heaven. The one wing is fasting, the other wing is almsgiving. The unfortunate thing is though, when we see these tools, we become Two things happen. Either we have a defeatist mentality, can't do it, or we start making up our own tools, which don't work. Here we have tools that our Lord Jesus Christ set in stage for us, so we can have success. So a defeatist mentality, for example, uh, can't do it. So they're already telling themselves that they can't, they've determined that the 55 days is too difficult for me and I'm going into it and I can't do it. It's like going into a match or a ring, a boxing ring or something and saying, I'm going to lose. Well, guess what? You're going to lose. This is a defeatist mentality. And it's not for any legitimate reasons that we have a defeatist mentality. It's just a powerless kind of behavior that we have about ourselves. We feel victimized always, victim of our own circumstances. So in this way, people don't change. Well, that's the way I am. I'm not going to change. And people don't change. Yes? But Christ is in the business of change. Instead, successful people or habits of successful people are those who are proactive. Those who set goals with the help of a guide and achieve the goals no matter how small they are. It is working out your mindset. That's where it's at. I'm going to give you a small story. I know it's very simple, but it's 
understanding how to change your paradigm, your understanding of your mindset. Um, one of my children, uh, I gave the duty to clean the garbage, collect the garbage and clean the garbage once a week. I gave that child the tools, I gave the child the instructions, and at the end I gave this child, I said, if things are too difficult, you can actually delegate this, this chore to someone else if you are unable. So now there's no excuse, everything's perfect. I come home the first, sun, uh, the, it's on Monday that the garbage collection is, and I come on Monday and I find out the garbage is not taken out. I walk into the house and I'm calm, I'm okay with this. Next week I realize that the garbage is piling up. Say, so I hope it happens this Sunday. Collect, collection should be on Sunday, and on Monday morning is this. So now I come home Monday night from work, and the garbage is still not out. Now I become a little angry, and I start using a little force, and reminding the child that there was an obligation, there was an understanding between us. Yes, yes, Dad, okay. The next Sunday, now the garbage is so much in the garage, I, can't, I don't know what to do with it. Anyway, long story short, I finally had to sit her down. I have three girls, so I, I'm not pointing out one over the other. I sat her down and I said, look, everything was set for you. What happened? And she broke down and started to cry, but it's so hard. And I said, what is so hard? And I started explaining, it's only the mindset that she thought that it was only difficult, but everything else was laid out for her. And she realized if it was only a mindset and I can change my mind, I can change my heart, I could do this. And she was encouraged. She said, okay, tell me again, what are the tools and what are the rules and who can, I, who can help me? I could do this. And it was all, all of it was is just the mindset. This has become from a defeatist mentality to a proactive mentality. And these are the successful people. The... The proper use, the other message from the gospel is the proper use of these tools. There's a little warning that our Lord Jesus Christ gave us here. Be careful not to use these tools without trying repeatedly understanding why you're using them. Over and over again, when you are using these tools, remind yourself again and again the purpose of these tools. The warning comes from Christ, and it warns the crowd from mundane repetitiveness of the tools. This is a, not a step-by-step -step guide of instructions of how to use the tools, but how not the improper way of using when you pray or when you fast, you shall not be like the hypocrites to be seen by them. Now you say, well, wait a second. We fast and we have a communal fast, but we also have private fasts. When we pray, we have private prayers and we have communal prayers when we all come together. Well, people see me. He says, he doesn't want you to deceive others. Just because you're standing here, it doesn't mean that you're praying. You're deceiving others. They think that you're standing here and you're praying. They see that you're eating food with Ameya and they think that you're fasting and living a repentant life, a life of free of sin. He doesn't want you to deceive others who suppose because you're standing here, you are praying. He wants a genuine relationship. He wants a genuine relationship with you. The other warning is, when you give your charitable deeds, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. The trumpet in the past grabs attention, right? People's attention is far away. You blow a trumpet and people's attention turns to you. So he says, going out of your way to capture the honor of men. If you offer God nothing, you will receive the same from Him. If you offer men something, you will receive honor from men. If you offer things to God, 
he will, you will get honor from God. It's easy to get distracted and to lose the purpose of these tools of prayer and the fasting and of, the, of giving or charity. One way of keeping yourself in track is continuously ask yourself, why am I doing this? See, it's, un it's unfortunate. We get accustomed in a comfortable rut and we go through the motions. We read the Agbeya. Okay, that's good. I pray the Agbeya. I pray from the Agbeya. I read the Tazbiha. Good. I chant the Tazbiha. Better. I pray the Tazbiha. Why am I doing this Tazbiha? I am praying. I read the Bible. Good. I memorize the Bible. Better. I live the Bible. Why am I doing this? And it's not just a sequential step by step. I have to read, then I have to memorize, then I will live it. No. This is all together. Some people actually live the Bible before they even read the Bible. Our grandparents and our, our great-grandparents were illiterate. They lived the Bible without reading the Bible. A little simple story. There was a deacon who, as a young deacon, was made a deacon. and He understood his parts. He has to say his parts, and he has to assist the abuna. So in one of the liturgies, he was standing on the altar, and there was an older deacon, a very good spiritual, good man, uh, God rest his soul now. Um, he says, this young deacon says, while I was standing there preparing myself for the part that's coming, this older deacon nudged me and said, pray. And for a second there I said, what am I doing? I am praying. I'm standing here. I mean, what do you think? And in my mind, I'm like, what does he want me to do? I'm a young, you know, that, that person is a young deacon, and he doesn't know. So, he's, and so the deacon says in his heart, and his mind, says, okay, maybe I'll say our Father who art in heaven. So he starts to say our Father who art in heaven. Then after a while, there's a little quiet, and his part comes up. And as he says his part, he realizes that he was telling him, pray your part. And like a light bulb, his mindset changed, his paradigm changed. He's like, oh, I'm praying these parts. I'm not just saying these parts. And from there on, his whole life started to change. He says, why am I waking up early on Sunday morning on a cold, rainy day? It's because I want to go to church. What's in church? I want to praise with the angels. Constantly questioning why. Why am I going to church? I want to meet who? I want to meet Christ. Why do you want to meet Christ? I want to see Him. I want to be touched by Him. I want His kindness. I want to see Christ for His forgiveness. I want to know Him more. I want to behold Him. I want to have a relationship with Him. So these are the warnings. These are the tools, and there is an improper way of using these tools. Be careful of them. So let's step back and understand what Christ wants from us is a relationship. These are the tools that are necessary for purity of heart, for the end goal of being with Him. So He wants to develop relationship. He says, well, I don't see how we can develop relationships from uh, uh, ch giving alms, prayer, and fasting. These are the three tools that, we, that the gospel gives us today. He says, when you give, you develop a relationship with others. When you pray, you develop a relationship with God. When you fast, you explain the interaction that you have with worldly things. And what's the bond that you have with worldly things? So let's do the, the first one. These are prerequisites. These relationships are prerequisites. So you can have a relationship with God. So, giving alms. And the New King German uh, version uh, says, alms giving is like charity. And charity is the word for love. So it says, it's not just giving of your money. It's giving of your possessions, giving of your belongings, giving of yourself, giving of your kindness, giving a smile, giving advice, giving attention to someone who needs the attention. Giving. Giving yourself. 1 John 4. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, that is, doesn't care, and doesn't give for his brother, he's a liar. 
He's a liar. For who does not love his brother whom he has seen? How can he love God whom he has not seen? Then he says, he who loves God must love his brother, must give to his brother. So you will not reach the love of God unless you first learn the love of others. Fasting. Fasting speaks about the bond that the world has on you and the, 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 relationship, the, the connection you have. There is no relationship between the world. The world does not love you back. You can love the world, but the world will never love you back. Anything that's worldly is anything that's negative that's going to pull you away from seeing God, from purity of heart. So we're talking about worldly things in that way. So St. John again says, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2. And St. James adds to this, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever chooses to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. How are you going to reach, reach the love of God if you're going to be his enemy? Prayer is a relationship with God understood. It's a communication, dialogue, you and God. It is approaching in faith God who is an all-consuming fire as silver is purified seven times in the fire. Prayer, the example is Moses. Moses went on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Continuous communication and dialogue in front of the almighty holy God. When he came down, the people said, Moses, your face is glowing so much for being with God. Please, we can't stand it. Cover your face. It's like if you would enter into a room and the, the person that you meet in the room is full of fragrance and perfumes. When you leave the room, you walk with the fragrance and the perfumes and the good smells on you. This is prayer. Don't leave the prayer unless you leave out with these fragrances with you. So these are the proper uses of these tools, that through them, one develops a bond relationship with the Lord, who then, entering your life, dwells in you, and mysteriously purifies you, purifies your heart, that ultimately you may be found worthy of entering His kingdom and seeing Him. And glory be to God forevermore. Oh.